whispers within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still. In all life's of heaven. even the demons to tremble but the name of Jesus we know at Easter we celebrate and think about his resurrection his crucifixion on that Friday and you know they didn't know what was going on all of heaven hell or hell I assume was celebrating and heaven was probably peering over wondering what in the world has happened to the son but those of us on this side of the cross know it was at the name of Jesus that stone was rolled away, that the earth trembled. The name of Jesus today, that we bring reverence and honor and worship. As we sing this together, think about that, the name of Jesus. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 
Hi, my name is Sarah Esposito and I'm 25 years old. I accepted Jesus as my Savior when I was about 17 years old. It was my first time coming back to church for quite some time and everything just felt right. The sermon spoke to me very deeply at that point in my life. And towards the end of that service, I found myself praying the sinner's prayer. The chills took over my body and I just knew I was meant to be there on that Sunday. Having a relationship with Jesus means absolutely everything to me. Um, it took a very long time for me to accept everything that I had gone through and the reasons I had gone through it. So once I made that connection and put that trust in Him because He knew me full-heartedly, it was much easier to just accept and follow the path that I'm meant to be on. I've been wanting to get baptized for quite some time. I find that this is a new chapter in my life. I'm about to get married and I've been a Christian for a while, so I just want to share this publicly with my friends, my family, and my church. A couple of weeks ago, Sarah came to see me and we talked in great detail and with great joy about her desire to publicly identify with Christ. In that conversation, we made it clear that there was really nothing about this water that transforms you or saves you. What this water is, is a, is a grave. It's a, it's a grave that represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's an outward sign of saying, I'm going to follow Jesus. It demonstrates what's happened in Sarah's heart. And I'm very glad Sarah, for your following Jesus, all of us rejoice with that. Uh, we rejoice with you and Michael and your engagement and future marriage. We rejoice so much in knowing about your future mother-in-law who is a part of our Eastside family. We just feel like Dorothy is, is, is family going back to Eastside Christian school years where Michael attended. We're thrilled today, relationally, and we're so grateful for you. So you wish to follow Jesus, Absolutely. and you wish to follow him now in baptism, Absolutely. to be baptized as he was. Yes. All right, let's do that together. You should put your hands here. You can hold on to my hands. Just hold on. I'm going to hold your nose and take you back. Sarah Esposito, because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, because you love him with all of your heart, because he has forgiven you of your sins, because you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, because he is your Lord and Savior, and you wish now to publicly identify with Christ, I gladly baptize you as my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sarah, you're buried with Christ in his likeness, and you're raised again to walk in newness of life. Thank you, dear, thank you. Go right this way. Okay. Amen. Matthew, sit right now. This is Matthew Eccles, Matt, and his wife Amanda, and their three year old son Elijah are becoming a new part of Eastside. They were in our new members class last Sunday afternoon. Matt knows the Lord Jesus as his Savior. We spent time together this past week and he shared with me that Jesus was his Lord, and he and his wife want to come to Eastside to grow and be discipled and identify with Christ. He wants to publicly identify with Christ in baptism. Uh, Matthew, thank you so much. And I, I should say that it will encourage our veterans out here that you, you are a Marine or were a Marine, am I correct? Yes, sir. Served our country. We're grateful for that. Many things in Matt's story of grace and brokenness, stories of uh, fresh starts, new beginnings, and you love the Lord Jesus. Yes, I do. And you want to identify with him today. Yes, I do. And Matt, there's nothing about the water here that'll forgive you sins. This is all part of a way for us, the Lord did it in a river, to say, we identify with his death, his burial, his resurrection. Just as you wore credentials, badges, that said, I'm a Marine. I, I'm, I'm, I follow the rules of the Marine Corps. Baptism is the badge of a believer. 
It tells everybody here and outside, anybody watching online, I belong to Christ. And you do belong to him. And we're grateful. So let's get baptized. What do you say? I right, hold my hands there, my dear friend. Matthew Eccles, because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, because he is the way, the truth, and the life in your life, because you've experienced his forgiveness of sins, because you are a product of the grace of God, because he loves you, because he knows you, because the Holy Spirit lives within you, and because heaven is your future home more than anything now because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. I gladly baptize you in front of all these sisters and brothers in Christ in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Matthew, you're buried with Christ in his likeness and you are raised again to walk in newness of life. God bless you, buddy. everyone. Thanks for joining us online today. We hope that if you're at home watching us today, that you'll be with us next Sunday live in the room as we continue the series, The Great Chapters of the Bible. I am uh, about to get into another great chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, but before I do, a couple of notes of importance. Uh, February in the United States is Black History Month, and so this month I'd, I'd like to present to you each Sunday as I can some significant African-American figure, an individual who has made a difference for the gospel's sake. And as I was looking this week, I found some historical characters. Then about the middle of the week, some history was made in the Southern Baptist Convention that I thought I'd pass on to you and celebrate that as we talk about Black History Month. I'm very happy to tell you that uh, Pastor Willie McLaurin, Pastor Willie McLaurin, you'll see his picture there. Pastor Willie is the brand new CEO of our uh, executive committee in our convention. Uh, that basically is the CEO of our convention, following Ronnie Floyd, who served there for about 30 months. So history will, is being made in that appointment in that that position is one of about eight major entities and their entity heads in the convention. And uh, Willie is the very first African-American entity head that we have had in the convention. And that is history. That's a great story. I hope you'll pray for him. And I hope that you'll remember him. And we celebrate, give praise to God and celebrate this wonderful appointment. He will do a great, great job. Second thing, just uh, housekeeping items to those of you that are Eastsiders that are watching us locally and this is your local church. If you go over to our south parking lot where the garage door and the awning is, you'll see that we have a brand new garage door and a couple of new glass doors that replace the still metal doors. That garage door was solid. It's been replaced with a modern door with window panes in it, giving a light to that room. That's something we've been wanting to do for some time, but did not have it set aside to do for another 18 months or two years. And our friends at East Cobb Church, whom you know are our tenants here and will be for a few more years, they were wanting to use that square footage for ministry. And so we worked out a, a cooperative effort together and they paid for the lion's share of that being done. Thank you, East Cobb Church. Wonderful to have you here. And we look forward to continued partnership. Now, would you please take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, this great, great chapter of the Bible on love. Let me read it, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning with verse 1, only covering verse 3, 
to verse 3, here's what Paul says. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. If I could give this a title today as we look at this great chapter of the Bible, first three verses, is the Apostle Paul is simply saying, love is the best. There is nothing better than love. Now, this is the fifth installment of our series, Great Chapters of the Bible. We began in Psalm 51, Psalm 23, then we moved to John 17. And last week, Jeff Cranston covered for us, in a great way, Matthew chapter 5. Today, we look at what will be three or four sermons in the, today in the coming weeks, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, called, appropriately so, the love chapter. Now, in our culture, we all know what February has in the center of its calendar. It's Valentine's Day. And it is a season, it is a time, it's a specific day set aside to express to the person you love, especially the persons you love romantically or those in your family that you love in a familiar way, just to express love to them. In fact, we express so much love tangibly or materially in the United States that there will be some $22 billion spent this very month on candy and flowers and cards. It's a way that we physically want to demonstrate to people that we love them. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 has such great, great elements to it. It's all about love and how love should be enacted in our lives as Christ followers. And I'm going to spend the next few Sundays right here looking at love and a month and time that celebrates love here and around the world. And today we look at verses 1 through 3. And it tells us in verses 1 through 3 that love is, again, the best. That love is prominent, nothing higher. That love is preeminent, that love is most valuable, that love is the blue ribbon. That love is first place, first prize. That love, if you will, is is the very best. Nothing can be better than love as 1 Corinthians describes it. Someone said that to define love is like trying to define a a beautiful rose. How do, you, how do you really describe it? To define love is kind of like trying to define a, an amazing sunset. How in the world do you put words that captures what you see and put it into the moment when you express it? It's very hard to do. But if we look at the Word of God, we find that grammatically, under inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul actually provides a word for love that we can understand because it's a love that describes God's love for us, God's very character and the love that he has, but also describes the way that we should love others. Now, if you look in the, in, in, in the Greek language, the time in which the New Testament was written and translated into Greek. There are three words in that era and time to this very day in the Greek language that are translated or communicated as love. Now, the first one is eros. Eros is where we get the word erotic. It's the word that describes passionate physical sex. It describes lust, it, it describes the, the, the desire to be intimate with someone else at that physical level. Now, the word eros, while it means love, a sexual love, while it is in Greek, it is not in the Bible, but it was a word that was used in Bible times. 
There's a second word in the Greek language that describes a, a kind of love, and that is the word phileo. Uh, when you hear of the word Philadelphia, it is the city of brotherly love. Adelphia is brother, phileo is affection, Philadelphia is seen as the city of brother love and its brotherly love and its origin. If you if we look at the word philanthropy, philanthropy describes a, a love that we should have for humans to the point that we care for them to make sure that their needs are met through philanthropic gifts or efforts. It's human love, it's a caring love, it's a charitable love at a very high level. And then there is a third word. You see it there on the screen. It is agapao, where we get the, the word agape that's commonly known among so many Christians. And it is love, if you will, with an emotion. It is a love of the will. It is, it is a love that communicates sacrifice for another. It's a love that, that focuses making others more important than yourself. This is the kind of love that God possesses, that is his very essence. When it says that God is love, it's describing agape, our agapao. It is a sacrificial giving other-focused love, putting others before yourself. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, these first three verses, in fact, throughout the entire chapter, Paul is talking about, communicating about that kind of love. It's a love that attaches a very, listen to this, it attaches a very high value to someone else. So when Paul is talking about what love is and what love isn't, he, when he talks about what love is, he, he's saying when you, when you have an agape love, you, you are placing a value that is very, very high in how you see that person, how you treat that person. Love is the best value you can give. It's the best value you can receive. It is the best thing you can pursue. It is is a tremendous thing, this thing called love. That's why Paul says, love is the best. There is nothing better than love. And in the neighborhood of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in this very book itself, he's talking to a local church. He saw the church at Corinth. And as we read the depths of the Corinthian message in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Paul is making it clear that this is a church that wasn't grasping the concept of sacrificial agape love. They weren't really catching the vision on that. They weren't really into it. Now, as we read, even in the neighborhood before and after 1st Corinthians 13, they were very much into spiritual gifts they were very much into getting spiritual gifts and experiencing spiritual gifts. And they were struggling with doctrine, but they were at least debating and discussing doctrine. But what Paul is saying in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, that while they were into spiritual gifts or might be into understanding doctrine, they were absent of love. They were Christ followers who had experienced the love of God, but they were not communicating the love of God to each other in that fellowship or in that community. You get the idea that the Corinthian church was a, was a very selfish church. It was about me. It was about us. But it wasn't about others. It's a picture of selfishness even in our own society, and it can be a, a picture of selfishness in our churches today, where we find we want to get together and just do our own thing with our own kind, for our own good, with little or no concern for those that are not a part of our immediate circle. That's a selfish kind of thing, and it is the opposite of an agape kind of love. 
You know, it's hard to, it's hard to love someone when, when, when you stray from the source of love. And the source of love is God. It was Jonathan Swift, the satirical author of Gulliver's Travels, who said this, We have just enough religion to make us hate, but not enough to make us love one another. One writer wrote this, Spiritual gifts, no matter how exciting and wonderful, are useless and even destructive if they are not administered in love. In Paul's letters, there is an emphasis on love. Then this writer says, the main evidence of maturity in the Christian life is a growing love for God, for God's people, as well as a love for lost souls. It has well been said that love is the circulatory system of the body of Christ. And at the heart of that circulatory system of the body of Christ, here at our church, as well as it should have been for the Corinthian church, is love. That should be central. And Paul is writing here and he's saying that love, again, love is the highest. Love is the best. Love is preeminent. Love is prominent. Love is the blue ribbon. There's nothing greater, higher, or more wonderful than agape love. And who is love personified? God himself. So what do you say? Let's look one more time. Beginning at verse 1, and look at this enriching love of God. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels. In other words, if I speak in tongues of human eloquence or angelical, angelic ecstasy. But I don't have love. I am a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I, I'm just making a lot of noise. The message paraphrased is if I don't have love, I am making the noise of a, of a creaking, rusty gate. I'm making a lot of noise if I don't have love. Here is the enriching love of God. I, I have never heard an, an angel speak, at least I don't know that I have. But I, I believe, based on biblical models, that if I heard an angel speak in a language, whatever it would be, that angel would be eloquent. Eloquent. One preacher put it this way, chatter without clarity is a sound without a soul. So here's the landscape of Paul's divine thought. He says, in all kinds of languages, if you speak them, with all kinds of accuracy and fluency and style, all of that human language, and then add to that angelic language, heavenly language, that, that, that could help spiritual lives. Paul says, if all of that is said, if all of that is communicated, but that communication from its speaker, from its communicator, did not possess love, I'm just making a lot of noise. I'm just clanging cymbals. I'm just making all kinds of resounding gong sounds. So what you have right here is, you, you, is again, the enriching nature of love. It's the value of love. What, what we have with love is, is priceless. Paul, Paul drives it home. The gift of languages, humanly speaking. And I've known some people that can speak five, six, multiple languages. They have a gift for languages. The gift of languages, humanly speaking, and the gift of, of 
spiritual translation speaking in heavenly angelic languages, it's all gibberish without love. It's nothing without love. And look at verse 2. In verse 2, he continues, he says, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can, look at this, move mountains. In other words, you, you say to a mountain, jump, and the mountain jumps. But if you say that without love within you, he basically comes around and he says, I have the ability to do that. I, I, if I do it without love, I really have nothing. I don't possess anything. Now, the first verse that we just read is, is about love from the heart. Now he talks about knowledge. So now he's talking about love from the mind. You can have a, you can have a knowledge of the Bible. Stay with me, Bible student. You can have a knowledge of the Bible. You can have varied degrees in Bible languages, systematic theology, Bible history, general uh, revelation, Old Testament survey, New Testament survey. You can study pneumatology, soteriology. You can be an expert on biblical eschatological issues, eschatology. You may have the ability to communicate that. You may have an incredible mind. You can understand Bible truth. You can teach the Bible. But if you lack love, it's a goose egg. It's a zero. You see, you can be a church filled with great Bible teachers, great Bible che preachers. And at the same time, you can be a church filled with gossip and bitterness and hatred. You may know the Bible, but if there is bigotry and favoritism and unkindness and destroying one's character, all that Bible teaching is for nothing because it doesn't possess love. See, that's what happens when you know a lot of the Bible, but you don't exercise love. Knowledge without love and faith without love adds up knowledge plus faith equals zero. It's zero plus zero plus zero. Now, the most important lesson in the school of faith is love one another. Love adds value to absolutely everything. Love is enriching. Love makes other people's lives better. There is nothing higher, there's nothing greater than love. Love, love improves everything it touches. Everything it touches. So that's verse 2. Now, let's go to verse 3, and we're almost done. In verse 3, he says, and if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I could boast about it, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now, for review, verse 1 teaches that love involves the heart. In verse 2, it teaches that love involves the mind, knowledge. Number three, it teaches in verse three that love involves the will. Now, now take a look at the screen for a moment as I'm talking about this, and let's imagine and let's look at this list here of simply writing down a, a string of zeros. Follow along with me. Let's just say we had a string of zeros, five or six of them. And here is what he has said in these verses. As he is saying here, if I have not love, if I have not love, if I have not love, everything I do, it's just a zero. For instance, eloquence alone, right? Eloquence alone is zero. Eloquence without love is zero. It's nothing. So you can be the most eloquent Christian speaker, communicator. I mean, you, I mean, the ability to just be an orate, just orator, actor, thespian, someone who can, who can really, really communicate. Amazing ability. 
But he says in verse 1, eloquence alone is a zero. And then he talks about faith. Faith alone is zero. Think about that. Faith is a big deal in the Christian life, is it not? Sure. But faith all by itself, I mean, I'm talking about faith. He's talking about faith in Jesus Christ, faith in God, faith in the Bible. Have faith in God. But if you exercise faith or I exercise faith and love is nowhere attached to it, faith alone adds up to zero. Nothing. Continue. Prophecy alone is zero. He says it here. That I have the ability to foretell or foretell, and I, I have a prophetic gift, yeah, spiritual gift, and I can, I can state something and be bold about it and, and, and rally people around it and cause people to be stirred with my gift of prophecy. Hey, he says, if you're doing that, and you don't have the love of God in the mixture, your prophetic gift is, is zero. Then what about knowledge? Oh, spiritual knowledge, that's important. Knowledge and maybe wisdom, the mind of God. I, I've got all of this knowledge, maybe it's experience. All of these things that you, you want to teach other people and pass along, Paul makes it very clear in the first three verses that if you don't have love with that spiritual knowledge or life experiences, without love, that's, that's zero. And what about sacrifice? Now, this is important. Sacrificial giving, sacrificial stand. I'm going to give my body to be burned. I'm going to take my stand and I'm going to draw a line in the sand and all the things that we talk about with conviction and respect. If that is, that is done, this is what he says. This is what he says. If it's absent the love of God, sacrifice alone is zero. And then there's one more, and that's martyrdom. That's pretty dramatic. Martyrdom alone is zero. Now, if you were to add up all of these things that you can say and do or have, spiritual gifts, eloquence, things that you possess or have a knowledge of, if you add up all of those zeros at the bottom, what you have is zero. Look at those spiritual gifts there. A church filled with born-again people who possess spiritual gifts but don't have a love for people and a compassion for people, a love for the body of Christ, a love for people who are struggling, the love of God in their hearts for their community, for their world, for the lost. That's a church that is a great big zero. Now, let's do one thing here. If you were to put the number one just to the left of every zero there, let's say a scale of one to 10, and you were to put the value of 10 being love next to eloquence and have love and faith and have love, and prophecy and have love, and knowledge and have love, and sacrifice have love, and martyrdom have love, suddenly every one of those zeros have a value of 10 on the scale of zero to 10. And suddenly you have at the bottom instead of zero, you have a multiplier of 60. Because love adds value every single time. With love you gain, with love you improve, 
with love, you, you, you add value. And the convicting thing, again, of these three verses is that without love, no matter what you do, say, or have, you gain absolutely nothing. So every Christian has spiritual gifts, just like those Corinthian Christians did. And Paul is saying when you add love into that mix of that spiritual gift that God has given you, that gift becomes exponentially more powerful and more value working within the body of Christ. That's the first three verses. Paul just says, you know what? Love is the very best. There's a man by the name of Dr. David Swope, and he told the following story in a commencement address that he made to students at a Christian college. He said, when I lived in Washington, D.C., I was privileged to meet Mother Teresa. And I asked her, don't you ever become angry at the causes of social injustice that you see in India and in the rest of the world? And her response was this, why should I expend energy in anger than I can expend in love? Why should I expend energy in anger that I can expend in love? You know, every single one of us have a limited time of energy, limited frames and time frames of, of living life. Every one of us have been gifted by God to minister to the body of Christ and our neighbors and community. How much of it are you expending on developing the gift, which is great, compared to how much time you are developing your love? Paul goes on in this particular passage, as we'll see in the weeks ahead, he says, love never fails, and that means not one single time. This great chapter of the Bible, Paul says, love is is the very best. How about this week for the rest of our lives in this community and to one another in our fellowship, what do you say let's work hard on loving people well? Father, thank you so much for your word, for these three simple and yet profound verses that immediately puts us in the context of where we need to be and how we use the spiritual gifts you've given us. Forgive us when we have failed to love people purely and unconditionally. Forgive us where we have judged people before loving them. We've made a conclusion on a person before just loving them. Would you just help us here to love people well. Thank you, Father, for your word and for this great chapter of the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, everyone, thanks for listening. Talk to you next time.